Amateur mistake, guys. Sorry about that. Had my mic muted. Good evening. Hope everyone's doing well. All right, we got a lot to cover tonight. Uh, hit that thumbs up as you come in. Help us out with the algorithm, if you would, please. I want to start the night with uh, the uh, national debt. Just take a look at it. Always like to center ourselves with um, what that's doing. We're up, well, we're, we're headed toward thirty-four trillion dollars. Uh, like a bullet at this point. It's absolutely obscene, ridiculous what's going on, if I can find it here. Um, got a lot going on this evening uh, in the country with your money, politics, and policy. You know, they all relate, right? Uh, here we go. All right. All right. So let me just set the stage for you, let you know what we're going to take a look at uh, this evening as we watch that national debt just run up like crazy. These guys are down there in Washington, D.C. Uh, just they're there. This is the uh, Titanic that we're on. And uh, they're down in the galley putting all the silver into a big tablecloth, knotting it up and running for the lifeboats. But look, guys, what we do here is we figure out ways to navigate these situations. OK, this is not doom and gloom. It's just reality. We know what's going on. So we got to figure it out. All right. So look, uh, let's start out with some policy, what's going on in the nation. Uh, Jack Smith, the special counsel uh, trying the Trump case, he just did something that is pretty dystopian. You know, tonight we're talking about how the power structure is reducing living standards. They're going to do that primarily through economics and a usurpation of our general uh, rights out there. So uh, this is pretty weird. Wanted to share this with you, maybe get a little comment on it in terms of what you think. But Jack Smith has said that he wants to collect uh, the Twitter, uh, a lot of Twitter files or X now, formerly Twitter, about all kinds of Americans, whether you agree with Donald Trump or not. Uh, and the question is why, okay? Um, Remember, guys, everything that goes on politics, policy and economics wise uh, puts your liberty, economic and otherwise, under threat. Special counsel Jack Smith demanded info on Americans who favorited or retweeted Trump tweets. Newly released documents show. Now, look, I don't care if you voted for Trump or you voted for the other guy. You can hate Trump, but you got caught up in this dragnet either way. All right. If you happen to uh, interact with him in any, any way uh, on Twitter. Uh, the special counsel, Jack Smith, demanded information on Twitter users who liked or, or, or retweeted former President Donald Trump's tweets leading up to the incident on uh, the 6th of January. Smith's comprehensive search warrant sought the 2024 Republican presidential primary front runners, that's a mouthful, search history, his direct messages, and content to all tweets created, drafted, favorited, liked, or retweeted by his account. Oh, hold on. That's from October 20th through January 2021. Uh, hold on, though. The special counsel also demanded a list of all devices that he interacted with. Among the uh, additional information Smith sought were a list of all Twitter users. All. Okay. Didn't say Democrat. Didn't say Republican. Didn't say those who voted one way or the other. All Twitter users who favorited or retweeted Trump's tweets, as well as all tweets that include the username associated with the account in mentions or replies. So you could have very well said, hey, look, I hate Trump's guts. OK, we got to get this guy out of there and we got to make sure he doesn't get back in there. You could have done something like that and um, you can get caught up in the dragnet. Now, why he needs that? I don't know, but um, it is very troubling. I'll say that. Now, we'll get more on that as the days and weeks go by, but this is just an example of how uh, dystopian we're getting out here, uh, especially with technology. Now, hang on, guys, because one of the things we're going to do tonight is we're going to go over some ways that you can insulate yourself and your family from the 
economic turmoil that we're going to be seeing more and more of, okay, in this country. Now, they came out today with the GDP report. And uh, hey, look, as usual, it's rosy. You know, everything's going so well. The United States is just gangbusters. It doesn't matter what you feel when you go out there and, uh, you know, spend money at the grocery store or try to uh, fuel up or try to go and ask your boss for a raise. None of that matters, okay? Uh, don't mistake that with what the government is saying. And they're saying that the GDP, uh, GDP growth is on fire, grew faster than anyone thought in the third quarter of 2023. But ominous signs ahead. Now, what are they talking about here? Yeah, Americans are spending, but not, not the way you think we are. I mean, you know what's going on, but we know they're lying for a few reasons. Shrugging off, off higher interest rates. We shrug that off. We don't care about the cost of money down here at the consumer level, right? According to the New York Post. Shrugging off higher interest rates, America's consumers spent enough to help drive the economy to a brisk 5.2% annual pace from July through September, that third quarter. This is according to the government's uh, GDP report. They previously estimated, uh, estimated that it was 4.9% annual growth, okay, in that quarter. Now they're coming out and saying it was even better than we thought, even better than we told you the first time, okay? This is a lie, right? And this is not happening because Consumers are flush with all of this disposable income. That's a that that's the story that they're trying to tell, and that's a lie. And it's important that we understand that it is a lie because we don't want to get tricked into thinking the situation is rosier than it actually is. Going out there and putting our economic situation in jeopardy because the government wants to get certain people uh, reelected. So they are saying that. We just read that. They're saying that this is because of the consumer, that the consumer is just doing absolute gangbusters. They're supporting this economy. And sure, we do have to spend money more than we were spending three years ago, right? Because at this point, things are more expensive. So yes, we are spending more, but it's not because we want to spend more. And then we've got this report, which basically contradicts this narrative that they're trying to paint that, uh, you know, the consumer is just doing so well. 76% of Americans have curbed spending due to inflation, okay? So the data is, you know, right here for the consumption. People are cutting back. They're not spending on things, again, because they want to. They're at the grocery store and they're coming away, family of four is coming away with a, uh, you know, a uh, $150 to $200 bill for a week's worth of groceries. Sure, they've got to cut back in other areas, but the ledger also sees an increased amount of money spent on groceries. Now, look, the biggest part of what happened over the third quarter was not due to consumer spending, okay? It was due to government spending. And government spending is part of that GDP calculation, all right? But how much did the government spend? Well, an incredible amount. Uh, in fact, and this is again, guys, this is, this is just rather obscene what we're doing uh, in this country and devaluing our currency. Uh, we've got a Congress, a White House, a Senate, that are composed of just outright profligate spenders that are acting extremely irresponsibly, okay? July 1st, 2023, our national debt, not counting the unfunded liabilities, but the national debt was $32.320 trillion, okay? So just over $32 trillion. As of September 29th, the national debt closed out at 30 $33.167 trillion. Three months, this government $47 billion. And the pace of that spending has increased since then. Okay. So <laughs> we don't have any budget problems in this country. We've got a hellified spending problem, is what we have in this country. So that 
almost one trillion dollars worth of government spending, and that's federal government spending. That's not counting local and state government spending, which also go into that GDP calculation. So don't believe the hype. Don't believe the lie. This is not the consumer supporting this. I don't believe these numbers are accurate. I think they're doing any and everything to try to obfuscate the real situation with inflation and the GDP prior to next year's election. But if we look at the facts, which we've been doing here tonight, we see that, hey, you can't say that the consumer is on fire if 76% of them are cutting back, right? Wages are stagnant, okay? Where's all this money coming from? Well, I tell you where it's coming from. I think you know as well, uh, it's coming from credit, okay? Uh, Americans are well over $1.5 trillion collectively in uh, credit card debt. And we are seeing that that's starting to grind to a halt, okay, in terms of the capability of Americans to keep spending even on necessities because we're, we're watching credit card delinquencies rise, okay? Let's take a look at that situation with the uh, credit card delinquencies here. All right, so, okay. Credit card delinquencies continue to rise, right? So this is a trend. This is uh, accelerating, unfortunately, because look, people are trying to fill that gap between stagnant wages and inflation. They're trying to fill that gap. They can't fill it with wages, right? So they're using savings. They're even paring down uh, retirement plans and credit to fill that gap and to be able to afford uh, life's necessities. This is why tonight we've got to talk about how to extricate ourselves to the largest extent possible from what is being created here, which is a very dystopian economic atmosphere, dystopian economically and otherwise. Um, it's almost as if the powers that be just want to force out the middle class, just want to end that paradigm, bring everybody in the world down to like a level playing field, uh, which is equal misery in terms of a wage, okay? Institute things like CBDCs and UBI or universal basic income to uh, kind of keep this thing going and create a very defined global economic caste system where it won't be as easy to transition from one economic strata to another because you'll have extremely rich individuals and companies and then you'll have uh, far fewer in the middle class and the abject poor. That number will unfortunately uh, grow. Okay, so this is what's this is what's taking place out there now. As as proof of that, I mean, I don't know who. If it, if there's anybody out here on this live stream, and guys, hit that thumbs up as you come and help me out with the algorithm. Anybody ever live in New York City? Let me know in the chat. Have you ever lived in New York City? I've worked in New York City. And if I never go back to New York City, it will be it will be too soon. Too congested for me. Way too expensive. Okay. Uh, so you've got okay, wise planner. You agree. I appreciate that. Thank you for the uh thank you for the comment, getting the chat going. Uh so you've got these extremely expensive urban areas, in New York being one of them, where people, working class people are being priced out. Now, one of the reasons why they can't keep up is because, again, inflation. And let me say something about inflation, because Joe Biden's out there saying that, oh, well, prices are down. He actually said inflation had come down 65 percent. Now, we know Joe Biden says a lot of crazy things, but that is insane. That has not happened. In fact, inflation is increasing based on government numbers at a slower pace, but it's still increasing. Okay. So if you come to me and say inflation was uh, 8% in 2021, and then you come at me and say, but in 2022, inflation was 3%. That doesn't mean that prices reversed. That means that inflation still increased 
only at a slower pace. So prices still increased. Wages still remain stagnant. We became poorer unless we can find assets that will appreciate um, more aggressively than the rate of inflation, right? So yeah, uh, we've got Biden out there saying, hey, um, you know, inflation is coming down, nothing. He probably honestly thinks that when he sees a reduction in the percentage increase, he probably honestly thinks, like I would imagine a lot of politicians think, that that means that inflation reduced. I think they think that, a lot of them, right? Because I've always had this um, idea that in order to take office, you should have to uh, take and pass a college level, with at least a B, a college level macroeconomics course. You should have to demonstrate that you have either taken such and did fairly well on it, or you need to sign up for one. Because there's no way in the world you should be in charge of a multi-billion dollar budget like the city of Baltimore, a multi-trillion dollar budget like the United States of America, or any state, uh, if you don't understand economics, okay? And they don't understand, a lot of them too often don't understand taxation, they don't understand inflation, and they doggone sure don't understand monetary policy, okay? So speaking of people who do not understand much, let's uh, hear what one pretty uh, vociferous, we'll call her vociferous and be nice, uh, Congresswoman has to say about, you know, what's what's happening in New York with regard to how expensive it has become to actually live there, okay? Enter All Out Crazy, uh, better known as AOC or uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the Congresswoman. Look, broken clock is right twice a day. And she's right. It is too expensive to live in, in New York City, but being the uh, uh, economic neophyte that she is, check out her solution, which actually will make things worse. Uh, so what she wants to do to reduce the, the um, I, I guess somehow in her mind, this will reduce the cost of living, but what she wants to do is basically tax the rich. That's the only taxation. That's the, the, the one trick ponies on that. Let's just tax everybody, right? So, okay, what does taxing the rich look like? Well, there, there's a trickle down effect to taxing the rich, because when you talk about the rich, first of all, we're not talking about a whole lot of people unless you start to reduce the amount it takes to be rich. Remember, um, President Obama, he at one point says, oh, yeah, uh, people making two hundred thousand dollars, they're rich. I bet you they don't feel that way today, especially. Right. Uh, so you're saying that you're lumping someone who makes 200 grand a year in with. Warren Buffett. OK, OK, fine. But you need to do that if your only trick in your bag is taxation, because there aren't enough rich people to make the tax the rich thing work. OK, so she wants to tax the rich, uh, you know, New York, because they're having a migrant migrant crisis. Another genius idea from New York. They came uh, up with this new budget that cuts out uh, public safety aka the police, right? Remember when all of the, you know, people were running around saying, let's defund the police. Remember that whole thing? And now people want the police back because their neighborhoods have been taken over by a criminal element and businesses can't function. Right here in Baltimore, you had an incident a few nights ago where you had just people run down a block of shops and just bust the windows out. Went in, took cash registers, 2 a.m. in the morning. Who's taking a cash register at 2 a.m. in the morning? There's nothing in it, okay? People are clearing that out at the end of the shift, all right? But this is what's going on, okay? The criminal element has just run wild in these cities because police have been defunded. And look, I try to steer clear of the police at all, all times, okay? Uh, Peaceful guy, law-abiding citizen. Uh, don't action with them at all. You know, I've had a few uh, 
I ran a red light many years ago and I got stopped and it was a pleasant interaction, you know, as pleasant as it could be. I didn't get a ticket. Okay. He gave me a warning. Um, but look, in any civil society, you're going to have an element that wants to take advantage of the law abiding, hardworking taxpayer. But in this society of late, what we've done is we've given carte blanche to that element that wants to prey on the tax base, on the legal law abiding tax base. Insane, right? So New York has had to further reduce its budget. Okay. Now think about the taxpayers up there. Okay. You're living in New York City. It's extremely expensive in New York City. And you're up there paying taxes to boot, right? You got all kinds of taxes uh, in every city, okay? You're paying some kind of taxes if you live anywhere. And now the government is coming to you and saying that we're not reducing your taxes, but we are reducing services, okay? Because look, we got a lot of new Americans we got to take care of. So you're going to have to foot the bill. You're going to have to bear the brunt. Uh, we're reducing public safety and uh, a whole lot of other things. OK, so this is what's going on. Just take the, all of that in. OK, in terms of understanding where we're going with this, where society is going, unless we as a society, quick, fast in a hurry, understand that we are now ensconced in a battle for civilization. That's what this is. OK, what are we going to do here in this country? Are we just going to give away the store? Are we going to invite everybody in? And then for our tax money, we're going to give it to this Eastern European country over here. We're going to give all of this foreign aid over there. We're going to set up a, a former enemy, Afghanistan, with their own military. Think about all that stuff we left in Afghanistan. Are we going to do that? Are we going to teach our children that mathematics is uh, racist? Okay. Or we're teaching critical race theory. Do you really think? that our adversaries in this world are bogging their children down with those kinds of lessons, or are they teaching them national pride and mathematics, <laughs> for example, okay? Now, look, I don't want to go off on a tangent on that, guys, but that has a lot to do with how this country will look economically and otherwise five and 10 years into the future, okay? And look, unless we do something quick, fast, in a hurry, <laughs> we're going to reach the point of no return quick, fast, in a hurry. Okay. All right. So let's um, take a look at one more thing and then we'll get into, I want to show you how this structure is being built to really control everything you do. If you have not seen Children of Men, with Clive Owen, great movie, check it out. Absorb the uh, setting that it's in. I think, honestly, that's the direction we're heading in. 1984, if you haven't read the book, go check out the movie, okay? This, this is sadly, they asked Hillary Clinton years ago what she thought of 1984. And what she said made you think that her opinion of it was like, and it, it was an instruction manual. It wasn't something to be avoided. It was just something to uh, apply carefully, okay? And we talk about this, guys, because listen, and this is the next uh, section we're going to go over here, freedom, all right? We can talk about money and you know acquiring wealth all day long, but it's just like your health. If you do not have, if you do not live in a free society, then wealth means nothing, okay? It, it it means absolutely nothing. Is this what we're is this what we're building here? So this is why we have to watch out for that. Now, speaking of that, guys, this is not a Second Amendment channel, but the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms, the right that you have as an American, or just as a human being, you do have a right as a human being to protect yourself. Okay. I mean, if you just sat in a field, okay, with nothing around you. No clothes on, you would go into that field with all of your rights, all of your divine rights. And if a, I don't know, a tiger came out of the woods, you would have a right to defend yourself. Okay. You have that right. Now it's it's about defending yourself, but remember, as we always say on this channel, your human body is your most important asset. Without it, you have nothing. 
So you have to be in a position to defend your liberty from all kinds of tyranny. Now, there are there's non-governmental tyranny out there. There's a tyranny of uh, walking down Pennsylvania Avenue at 10 o'clock at, at night. That's a street here in Baltimore. Uh, and uh, having your liberty and property stolen from you by some young scholar. OK, uh, so there's all kinds of tyranny that we need to protect ourselves against. But we've seen throughout history that in those places where natural rights are denied, we have seen that there's also a correspond, uh, corresponding drag on any ability to improve your lot economically. OK, we can always draw it back to economics. But in this country, and you have to ask yourself, why is the left so it, politically, the political left, because the, the rank and file left voter does not feel this way, but the left feels strongly, the political left is always trying to take away that Second Amendment right. And I have a neighbor who says, uh, well, what do we need the Second Amendment right for? It was made when, uh, you know, they were concerned about fighting the government. Now, now, yes, that is true. But you don't have to look at a country like China and the Cultural Revolution. You don't have to look at Stalin, Isk era, Russia slash Soviet Union to understand that tyranny, all governments at some point, or another, some sooner than others, all governments arc toward tyranny, all of them. And so if we look at the, the history of the United States, we have several, we have several instances where certain demographic groups were denied the right to defend themselves and their property, and they were subjugated. Now, of course, the first one was the slave trade, okay, where uh, Europeans went to West Africa and traded. This was not a war. This was a trade and traded for slaves, brought back many of them to the United States of America and were prohibited from owning any weapons. Of course, right? Because you don't want them to upset the apple cart of the commerce engine that was slavery at the time, right? Uh the usurpation of uh, labor, okay? And your labor has a value, right? So we see there, besides all of the physical, mental, and emotional brutality that was involved there, we also had a usurpation of property, okay? Your right to earn a living, okay? All right, so we had that. Can't own guns. You can't oppose us on that. This is the United States, okay? This is not the Cultural Revolution in China. This is not uh, Pol Pot's regime uh, in Southeast Asia. All right, so then you had also instances where another asset, so we got labor, now we got real estate. We saw with several Native American tribes, the United States prohibit them from owning firearms, and then they forcibly removed these people from their real estate, okay? Another asset. Then you bring it up into the 20th century, you had the internment. This was enacted by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt during World War II. And during the internment, a lot of people just focus on the Japanese internment. But in point of fact, there were also Italian Americans and German Americans that were interned as well. And property seized from them. And many of them never got their property back. Okay. You know, so you, you had men with weapons come in and demand that these uh, Japanese, Europe, uh, Japanese, Italian, and German uh, Americans, okay, they were Americans. Their ancestry was from those places. Uh, and they were uh, locked up. Okay. I said, because you look like. Because you have a last name that sounds like we're going to put you in uh, this internment camp. Okay. So that those things happen here in America. So this is why, okay, when we see a, you know, removal of rights, we see a appropriation of property. Okay. And property has value. All right. So 
it is no shock that in the midst of this, there is some new polling out there that is, um, I would guess you would say, uh, in agreement with what I'm saying from the standpoint of preserving those Second Amendment rights. Now, again, I understand, guys, this is not a Second Amendment channel. I get it. But we have to talk about the panoply of uh, what's going on with politics, policy, and economics in order to uh, best understand how to move forward, okay? So here we go. New polling shows that the majority of American households own guns and support gun rights. Now, if it's a majority, that would include folks on the left side of the political spectrum and the right. Exactly, right? So, uh, and this was an NBC poll, okay? I called them um, uh, nothing but coonery. Um, exactly, CBS. Uh, those are my acronyms for the um, network news. According to NBC, a majority, 52%, now say that they are someone in their household owns a firearm. Most notably, the Harvard poll shows that six in 10 voters believe owning a weapon is necessary as a part of protecting themselves from criminals. And I will just let you define however broadly or narrowly uh, you want to define criminals, okay? Uh, some of them wear hoodies and let their pants sag. Some of them wear $2,000 suits. I'll let you decide, okay? All right, now let's, let's go ahead and take a look at one of the major ways that uh, the not just the governments, but the major uh, investment companies, okay, like BlackRock, State Street, you know, you know those guys, uh, as well as non-governmental organizations. These are the ones you got to watch out for, guys, because, you know, you know who your senator is, right? You know who the president is. You know when election day is, right? But you don't know, do you know who Augustine Carstens is? Augustine Carstens is the type, let me know whether or not you've heard of him before. Just put it in the chat if you can. Augustine Carstens is the head of the International uh, Bank of Settlements, the um, Central Bank of Central Banks. Okay, that's who he is. And he's out there time to time. He'll have... Uh, lot to say on the establishment of central bank digital currencies, okay? Uh, but if you don't know who he is, then even though a lot of what he says is like really scary, uh, you might not be looking for it, right? I'd, I'd encourage you, we've done a lot of uh, reports on that organization and how they are really ramping up the development of CBDCs. Now, in America, there's something standing in the way of that. And it's called the United States Congress, okay? A, a, the people, all right? Uh, Congress has the right to issue money, not the Fed. So unlike the other central banks around the world, our central bank is not government owned, okay? The Bank of England, People's Bank of China, those are government owned instant uh, entities. The uh, Bank of Nigeria, for example, Nigeria's central bank, they just forced the CBDC down the throats of the Nigerian citizens, okay? Uh, and one of the ways they did that, interestingly enough, was they put a spending cap on them for cash, all right? And they forced them over into this uh, CBDC. Now, the other thing that would really, this makes governments salivate. These governments and non-governmental organizations, they really get excited when you talk about coupling the central bank digital currency with all of these new rules that they want to establish around climate change, okay? Um, that's the big thing. That's where they're trying to go is to couple your freedom Two, uh, whether or not you're a good citizen with regard to 
how much carbon you emit, okay? You carbon-based life form you. Uh, so coming soon, your travel will be restricted by personal carbon allowances. Now, there's a lot more here than just that. I'm going to get into it. Experts suggest your standard of living will be reduced by over 85% if this paradigm shift takes place to the extent that they want it to. Now, look, when you say your standard of living will be reduced by 85%, look, guys, I'm not flying around in a private jet. I don't own a yacht, okay? Uh, what are you talking about? It, it, reducing it by 85%? What are we going back to, the old West? All right, well, maybe, maybe for those at our socioeconomic level, maybe that's what they want, all right? Now, Bill Gates, he'll still be able to fly around the world in a private jet as long as, yeah, yeah, I planted a thousand trees somewhere, okay? That's the kind of thing that they, they'll play it like uh, the Catholic Church used to play the indulgence game. Okay, so uh, if you were, you know, a sinner and you came and tried to do confession, uh, maybe you got to say 10,000 Hail Marys to get, you know, back in God's good graces. And guys, I am a Catholic, so I'm not being derisive here or disrespectful. This happened. Okay. Uh, but the wealthy, all they need to do is make a contribution and, you know, worked a little differently for them. So a report on the future of travel and tourism co-authored by a travel agency called Intrepid Travel and the Future Labs Institute posits a future deeply impacted by climate change and restrictions on tourist travel to combat it. I saw earlier this week an excerpt from, um, I've never watched the whole movie, um, with Al Gore's uh, Inconvenient Truth, where he was saying that uh, there will be no more snow on Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, within five years of his movie, it's been like, I think it's been 15 years. And it, it's like the guy went up there and it was like three feet of snow in the mountain. Uh, so these guys get real doomsday with it. I guess that's what happens when you think you're going to be president and it doesn't happen. It kind of drives you crazy. Apparently, uh, a sustainable future for travel warns of travel extinction for us. Okay. The rich can keep going wherever the hell they want to go on their yachts, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, I think he's a great actor, but he's, well, what a hypocrite. Uh, this guy's got this huge yacht, uh, but then he comes and preaches to us about, you know, your SUV. Um, a personal carbon emissions limit will become the new normal as policy and people's value drive an era of great change. So how are they going to do that, right? How are they going to impose or enforce a personal carbon emissions limit? How would they do that? Well, of course, they would do it through a central bank digital currency. Now, check this out. Experts suggest, experts, it's always experts. Who are the experts, right? Experts suggest that individuals should currently limit their carbon emissions to 2.3 tons each year. So if you're in the United States, we got folk actually in all of these places, US, UK, Australia, and Canada. So all of the UK, you are the lowest with an 80% reduction. The rest of us are looking at 85% or greater in terms of the reduction of our emissions, which are part and parcel of our standard of living. Right now, okay, all of us are using up carbon in some kind of way just to be on this live stream, right? Um this is where they want to go. Okay. I like that. I like that penny lane. Greenwashing. Right. Okay. And a lot of people who are unaware are going to fall for this. So they're trying to remove the, the ability to travel. Right. That's just one part of this. What the, the, the nuts and bolts of this is reducing your quote unquote carbon footprint. Okay. So that's going, that's so broad. Think about it. That encompasses what you eat. Okay. Um, of course, what you drive, we're seeing that where you work, how long you work, maybe how much money you make. Okay. Now they'll be able to enforce all of this. Nate Ree, good evening to you. How you doing? Thanks for joining. Uh, they'll be able to enforce all of this through a central bank digital currency a government-sanctioned 
central bank digital currency. Guys, understand, I'm not engaging in fear-mongering here. We're just reading the tea leaves, all right? Uh, I don't want anybody to accuse us here as soldiers of finance of um, fear-mongering or doomsaying or anything like that. I think a lot of people, um, they say things like that when they become extremely uncomfortable, when things start to click in their mind and they say, oh, you know, this could happen. That's uncomfortable. I want to kind of hide my head in the sand a little bit longer. Uh, you're a doomsayer, climate denier. You know, we're in the era where all you got to do is like throw out a word uh, and people will react a certain way to that word. OK, if they're not, you know, well balanced intellectually, you can just like Pavlov's dog. It's a Pavlovian response. So you can throw out a word that ends in ist, okay? You, ist, and that will end a lot of arguments because it will just transform, uh, you know, a lot of the thinking of people to, okay, now you got the scarlet letter, okay? He just called you an ist, all right, or a phobe. So uh, that's all that needs to be said. No more reasoning needed. All right, guys, so I think you see where this is going. So now we got to talk about how to insulate ourselves. And we do a lot of this on the channel already, but we got to have a conversation on how we insulate ourselves from this. Well, uh, the fact of the matter is when CBDCs are instituted, um, this whole paradigm shift, okay, in order to, unless you are willing to just separate yourself from society wholesale and, you know, do the Grizzly Adams thing up in the wilds of Alaska, Unless you're willing to do that, you're going to have to interact with the system in some way, shape, or form, okay? It's just only natural, okay? So I don't want to give you, I don't want to give anyone the impression that we're going to be able to absolutely, totally sidestep everything that's coming coming down the pike in terms of societal change economically, right? Yeah, you can opt out of certain things. I don't watch uh, televised news, okay? It's bull crap. I haven't watched it in going on 15 years, believe it or not. Um, so yeah, right? Uh, I've opted out of that. Uh, I opt out of certain, I do X to an extent. I, I need to become more comfortable with it, but there's, there, I, I've opted out of um, professional sports. It's bread and circuses, right? To keep you distracted. I don't begrudge anybody who, uh, you know, different strokes for different folks. But for me, I try to look at systems that are in place and opt out of those. All right. Uh, to give you another system that is failing the country, and I encourage people to opt out of it to the extent that they can, public school, government school, okay? We covered it earlier in the uh, in this live stream. What are they teaching? All right? Right here in Baltimore, you've got like so many schools that can't even uh, get 6% of the students to be proficient, test proficiently in mathematics in the 23rd century, Okay. All right, so how do we solve this problem, guys? How do we insulate ourselves to a degree? How do we maintain economic freedom, social freedom? Okay, how do we do it? Well, one way to do it is to invest in things and to understand. Now, we have done, I encourage you to go back and look at some of the videos we've done this week already, talking about, or maybe this was last week, how more and more countries are abandoning the dollar, right? We looked at the debt in the beginning of this live stream. We know that the Biden administration has chosen to, and look, to be fair, Biden's not the first one to impose sanctions on a country, okay? This is a thing that the United States has done for many, many decades, okay? But the world is tired of it. They're tired of saying, hey, look, I'm buying your debt. I'm investing in dollar-backed assets. And then as soon as we have a disagreement, you're going to use that against me, okay? The world is saying, no, we're fed up with that. So here recently, and we did a video on it, you saw Egypt and India say, all right, well, for any trade between ourselves, we're going to do it in local currency. We're not going to do, we're not going to use a dollar. We had months ago, one of the African countries come out and say, look, there's six countries here. We do trade between ourselves. We can do it in local currencies. All right. Don't let anybody tell you that this is not going to catch on. Okay. Guys, hit the uh, thumbs up as you come in. Please help me out with the algorithm. All right. So we've, we've, We've got the dollar losing prominence. Now, again, let's be reasonable about it. We're not going to wake up tomorrow, next year, five years, and nobody's using the dollar. That's not going to happen. What we are going to wake up to gradually is a world with multipolar economic 
ethnic dominance. Okay, it won't just be the U.S. Now, I'm going to tell you how to measure this. There are two ways you can measure it. You can measure it, one, in the percentage of global transactions taking place in dollars. Okay, that's an easy way to track it. Because uh, when, when people say the dollar is losing prominence, we got we to gotta put some math behind that and be objective about it, right? So what's another uh, measure that we can take a look at uh, and determine whether or not the uh, dollar is indeed look, uh, losing pro uh, prominence or dominance? It's the uh, measure, let me think for a second. Uh, we've got the transactions and... We've got we we the other measure we need to look at is the amount of reserves that other countries hold in dollars. Okay, now both of those have been well. That first measure, the transactions that fluctuates a little, but it's been coming down. It's been in a kind of downward direction overall. Uh, if you track it over decades, and that other measure, the amount of dollars held in reserve, that's definitely down. Okay, and I predict it's going to slip below fifty percent by the mid 2030s. Now, what are these countries buying instead of United States debt? Well, they're buying gold. These central banks are buying gold like never before. Record breaking gold purchases by these central banks. Okay. Now I'm not a central bank. You're not a central bank. So when we look at something, an asset like gold, we have to evaluate it and understand what does it do? Well, it is not designed to make you rich. Okay. It is designed as a store of wealth to preserve your wealth, your purchasing power. I always give this analogy or this example. Okay. So if we somehow were able to resurrect King Tut and give him back all of the gold that he possessed at his height of power and prominence, he would be as wealthy as he was when he passed away. Okay. He'd be able to purchase the same amount of stuff that he was able to purchase then. Of course, instead of a chariot, it might be a Bentley, okay? Instead of a pyramid, it might be some multi-million dollar home, okay? But you get the picture, right? So gold is designed as a store of wealth, preserve your purchasing power. But you have to decide to what extent gold may or may not have place in your portfolio, but it is one way to preserve your purchasing power in an era where we have seen the United States dollar since 1971, when Nixon, Nixon took us off the gold standard. Since then, the U.S. dollar has lost 98.2% of its value. All right. So we need to think in terms of how do we preserve our wealth? The dollar ain't doing it. Okay. So that's one, one way that we can start out by preserving wealth. Um, there are a variety of ways to do that. Gold ETFs are out there. Some people prefer mining companies. A few years ago, uh, Warren Buffett even invested in a mining company. It was short-lived. He came out of it real quick, but he did it. Okay. All right. Now, we've been talking more and more in the channel about crypto. Now, here's my position on crypto. It's here to stay. All right. And I told you in the video we did about a week ago that I don't want anyone to be caught where I saw a lot of people get caught in terms of the computer revolution and the internet revolution. Those are two things that happened uh, in my adolescence. Well, the computer revolution happened in my adolescence. The internet revolution happened in my uh, early 20s, early to mid 20s. And I saw a lot of people take a look at both of those and say, what will we ever need a computer for? They couldn't see it, right? But my mother and my uncle, they always would say, get into computers. They didn't know what that meant, what it would do, but they did see that it was the future, right? And they encouraged us to, you know, delve into it. The internet, a lot of people were like, what, what is this? You know, the World Wide Web, eh, whatever, okay? Couldn't see it. And now look where we are. So imagine, now those two things, the computer and the internet, they're going to make quantum leaps again as we go toward 2030. But I want people to at least study crypto. That's why we've been doing more content on it. All right. Because I'm not saying you got to go out there and buy this coin and that coin. I'm never going to do that. All right. But I am going to bring you news about the phenomenon. 
because I want you to be educated about it, whether you endeavor in it or not. But some people say that there's a lot of financial sovereignty to be had with things like Bitcoin because, uh, you know, you can cross borders with it. Uh, you can, uh, it, it, it has a value. Look, there was once a time in this world where seashells had, you know, a tradable value. Okay, so wherever you have people agree that something has value, yes. One of my one of the issues I'm still struggling with with crypto is um, that it, it doesn't have any kind of intrinsic value to it. Okay, um, that is, is a trait it shares with the U.S. dollar. By the way, uh, there's just agreement on it having value. But look into that from the standpoint of you know preserving wealth or even preserve preserving the ability to purchase things without having to do so through a central bank digital currency which may be interdicted uh you are told that you have reached your carbon credit for the month and you can't have any more red meat because red meat is, you know, a carbon rich uh, type of luxury. Okay. And unless you're willing to plant 10,000 trees, you can't have that T bone. Okay. Your CBDC won't work for that. Stranger things happen, guys. Don't uh, underestimate being designs that uh, some have on our uh, economy. Okay. Uh, Exchange value for value. What do I mean by that? There was a time where I said, you know what? I need a hardcore skill. I was a lobbyist. Okay. And let's just take it to the furthest extent. Aliens land and zombies attack. The world is a different place. No one needs a lobbyist, right? So I got trained as an emergency medical technician. I was a member of a volunteer fire uh, company and I went out and I actually had hands-on experience doing that. I still have my reference manuals. I still know that stuff, right? So have some sort of value that you could possibly trade. I know one thing, my brothers are very mechanically inclined, okay? And they do break jobs for folks. Uh, you know, they do little things throughout their communities where they can trade, you know, for uh, their services as mechanics. Uh, and they're not mechanics, but they are mechanically inclined. They can fix anything. They can build anything. Uh, so that's another thing you may want to consider. Now, get organized locally, okay? Yeah, the internet is a great thing. I was just talking to someone the other day about how this channel amazes me because we really have a global audience, right? How many millions of dollars would I had to pay, which I didn't have, uh, you know, in 1990 to get a global audience? It would have been impossible, right? Uh, get to know the people in your local community. If you avoid or if you need to avoid a central bank digital currency, many of the conveniences of society will be unavailable to you. Imagine if we had to use a, that mechanism today instead of the dollar, right, to make purchases, okay? Totally trackable. Uh, you could combine it to your social credit score, which will be linked to the amount of carbon credits that you need to live an 85% reduced lifestyle. You will probably be unable to shop at Walmart and large stores of any kind under this rubric uh, because they will definitely be roped into the CBD, uh, CBDC system. You have to become more self-sufficient. And that's what it's all about, guys. You're more self-sufficient. Again, no one's asking you to become uh, Grizzly Adams, but we do have those in our society today that are very resourceful and have opted out to large aspects of the society while still maintaining an economy. You can look at the Amish as an example and the Mennonites as an example, um, you know, of that. So you don't have to go 100%. So guys, look, that's some food for thought. Okay. Um, take it and do with it what you will. Just some food for thought here. I do appreciate everybody joining. We're going to go ahead and end the live stream, but uh, listen, I really appreciate you guys joining. Uh, share this content. If you're not a subscriber, come on in. Let me know you subscribed in like the um, uh, comment section of a video and I will salute you because you would have become a soldier of finance. Share this stuff, guys. We need to talk more about it. 
more live streams uh, streams to come. I hope you all enjoy your evening. Thanks for joining. Talk to you soon.